At Christmas, we give thanks that this king is born, that this king is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, and that this king is coming again to claim his kingdom. And the invitation of Christmas is to live under the gracious rule of this good king and to step into his marvelous light. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you've joined us today as we continue to look at the coming of Jesus. You know, often we think of him coming, being born to Mary, laying in a little manger, maybe not necessarily thinking about the fact that that little baby who came some 2,000 years ago is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But Jonathan, that's what we're looking at today. Well, that's exactly right. And the Old Testament scriptures are full of these extraordinary and wonderful and really quite beautiful promises of the coming of the Lord for our salvation. And today we're going to think about one from the prophet Isaiah, which is a promise that light would dawn upon a dark land. And that's one of the great images of Christmas, light coming into a world of darkness. And that is what Jesus brings. He brings the light of God's truth and the light even of God's salvation. Well, as you just heard, we're going to head to the book of Isaiah. We're looking at chapter 9, the first seven verses there today. So grab a Bible, meet us there as we begin the message, The Long-Awaited Child. Here is Jonathan. I gather that about 360,000 babies are born each day around the world. That means that while we're gathered here this afternoon, about 15,000 new lives will enter the world. The birth of a child is, of course, always an exciting thing. It's always a joyful thing to welcome a new life into the world. But I guess the arrival of most babies won't be headline news, won't change the world. Sometimes, of course, an enthusiastic parent will publish a birth announcement in the local newspaper, wanting everyone to hear the news of their happy arrival. But even then, you know, it's printed somewhere near the back of the paper, and probably only a few will actually notice. I mention all that because our passage this evening is, in essence, no more and no less than an announcement of a birth of a child. We might be tempted to skim over these words quickly, thinking that this is kind of back page material and not headline news. But even a quick read of these verses of this chapter tells us that this is no ordinary announcement and this is no ordinary child. It's no ordinary announcement because the child of which these verses speak, he has yet to be born when the verses were written. Normally, of course, an announcement is made after the birth of the child. That makes sense, but not in this case. In fact, when this announcement was published, the happy day was still centuries and centuries down the line. Well, and as for the child himself, he's pretty unusual too. This is a child who will not only transform a nation, we're told, but will change the world. This prophetic birth announcement in Isaiah chapter 9, it comes at a pretty low point in the life of the nation of Israel and in the book of Isaiah. The time is the 8th century BC, and the people of God, they're not trusting God and they're not obeying Him as they should. And the Lord has just promised to bring a judgment against them in the form of the great Assyrian Empire. We heard something about that in another reading earlier. The Assyrians, they were the great superpower of the day. They had the biggest army, the most fearful weapons. They were the nation to fear. And the Lord has promised that this great superpower is going to sweep through the northern kingdom of Israel and wipe it out entirely. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel will disappear. And the southern kingdom, the territory of Judah, it'll only narrowly escape destruction. But now in Isaiah chapter 9, the clock moves forward a little and the Lord speaks to his people as they're living through that awful time, as they're now in the midst of it. The Assyrians have come, the Assyrians have brought their destruction and their humiliation. And so now in this chapter, in the verses we read, we find the people of Israel living through a time of darkness. They are a land and a people living under the judgment of God, tasting and seeing the fruit of their own rebellion. 
And of course, as we think about that and we get ourselves into the world of this text, we don't need to work very hard or look very far to see the resonances with our own day and indeed to see the darkness of our own time. We only need to open our newspapers in the morning, don't we, to read of wars, of threats of war and the awful fallout of war. I saw a report just this week of the conditions in a Greek refugee camp for those fleeing violence in the Middle East. Awful conditions. Thousands of families living in terrible squalor on the edge of wealthy Europe. We don't need to look very far to learn of urgent health crises, of violence and murder in our own communities, of a dreadful drug problem sweeping through North America. It was reported this week that life expectancy in the United States has fallen for the second year in a row. That's the first time that's happened in half a century. And analysts say that the opioid crisis is significantly to blame. There's plenty of darkness all around us. We don't need to look very far to find it. And if we probe the Bible, probe the scriptures to ask what's going on, the Bible will tell us quite plainly that we're seeing the results of collectively turning our back on the Creator. In His wisdom and His judgment, God our Creator has allowed us to experience something of the fruit and something of the consequence of turning away from Him. But into a dark land, a land living under the shadow of judgment, in a land experiencing distress and chaos, Isaiah now speaks some wonderfully hope-filled words. He announces the birth of a child, a child who would come and who would change the world. The chapter opens by proclaiming that this child would bring light to a people living in a world of darkness. Verse 1 again, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The 100th anniversary has just passed of a great explosion that rocked Halifax when two ships collided in its harbour in December of 1917. To commemorate the disaster, the CBC published a series of colourised photographs of the aftermath. They were tragic and vivid images of death and of destruction, of a city shattered and row upon row of coffins lining the streets. As I saw those pictures, I couldn't help but think of Isaiah's description of Israel as a land living under the shadow of death. It's an awful thing. We only need to hear mention in verse 5 of warrior's boots, of battle, of blood-stained garments, to know that it has been a dark and a dreadful time in Israel. But now there is, for this darkened land, a wonderful promise of light. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this light is the direction from which it is going to come. The light is going to dawn in the northern territory. From the direction of those places mentioned at the beginning of the passage in verse 1, Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles, that's up north of Judah, north of Jerusalem. And it's the very direction from which the darkness had descended, the direction from which the Assyrian invasion had first come, the direction from which the judgment had fallen. As the years went by in Israel, this northern territory came to be rather despised by those living in the south, closer to Jerusalem. It was seen as kind of out of the way, distant from the temple, and compromised by all the foreigners who had settled there in the wake of the invasion. If you lived up in Galilee, to the people of Judah, you were an outsider. But from this very place, from the place of the shadows, the light would dawn. Salvation would come. Galilee would be the home of Jesus. The place where he grew up, the place where he lived, where he spent his childhood. And so Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Galilee, would come into the place of darkness, would live in the midst of shadow. He would minister to those who lived in the shadows at the very edge of society, 
to the most needy and the most broken people. If we read the gospel story, we see plenty of that. And he would plumb the very depths of the darkness, dying on a Roman cross to bear the punishment for our wrongdoing and our rebellion against our Creator. We're told that as Jesus died, darkness fell on the land at midday as the sun refused to shine. And more than that, Jesus went into the darkness of isolation, excluded from the Father's presence, crying as he died, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the 5th of August, 2010, a collapse at the San Jose Copper Gold Mine in northern Chile trapped 33 miners 700 meters underground and 5 kilometers from the mine's entrance. An international rescue operation was mounted that would ultimately take 69 days to complete. Waiting for over two months for rescue in the pitch blackness of the collapsed mine, the men recounted the experience of waiting in the darkness for death to take them. But thanks to this astounding international rescue effort, costing $20 million, none of the 33 men was lost. The rescue plan involved lowering a specially made module into the mine, which would then carry the miners up one by one by one. But in order for the plan to work, in order for it to be possible, a rescuer had to be willing to travel down in the pod, reach the trapped miners, and then prepare them for the journey up. An estimated one billion people watched on TV as rescuer Florencio Avalos descended into the darkness to begin this great operation. It takes a special kind of courage to willingly leave the light and the freedom of the world above to descend into the darkness for a very dangerous rescue of that kind. But of course, in the bravery of that rescue, that Chilean rescue, we have just a hint, don't we, and just a faint reflection of what Christ did for us. He descended into this dark world and then into the depths of the darkness of death itself that he might bring us, might bring me and might bring you into the light of forgiveness, into the light of life itself. I think we're all aware of the darkness around us, the darkness of this present world. Not that everything's dark, of course. So much is wonderful and bright in this world. So much is worth celebrating in the warmth of community and the beauty of the natural world. Yes, there's plenty of light, but there's plenty of darkness too. Plenty of sadness, plenty of suffering, plenty of evil. It's hard to miss the shadows all around us. We're aware of the darkness, but my question for each one of us this afternoon is this. Have we noticed... Have we seen, have we realized that light has broken into this dark world? Has it ever hit home for you personally that at the very first Christmas, God himself came down, born of a young woman, to enter this darkness and to flood it with his light? 700 years and more before the birth of Christ, Isaiah the prophet, he announces the coming of a child, a child who brings light to a people living in a dark world. But that's not all that Isaiah has to tell us about this child. No, this child who brings light to a people living in darkness also brings hope to those living in a world of chaos. Verse 6, for to us, A child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. We don't need to be experts in international relations to recognize the awful burden of living under bad government and bad leaders. The world is full of despots and dictators, those who oppress their people rather than serve their people. We know the ugliness, don't we, of a North Korean rule, the chaos of an Afghanistan or an Iraq, the brokenness of so many former Soviet republics. And although we give thanks for all that we enjoy in a good country like Canada, for stability and for the rule of law, 
We experience enough social chaos even here, even at home. We know enough of the reality from time to time of compromised leaders and scandal and disappointments. Theodore Roosevelt once quipped in his day that when they made the roll call in the U.S. Senate, the senators didn't know whether to answer present or not guilty. (laughs) There's no perfect government, no perfect leader here in this present world. But the promise of Isaiah chapter 9 is the promise of truly, thoroughly good government, a flawlessly good government, good government that grows and lasts and endures even forever. The announcement is that a king is born who will have these thoroughly wholesome, thoroughly wonderful, thoroughly good names. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, a king with wisdom to lead and guide and help his people. Mighty God. This king will be none other than God himself. The sovereign, all-powerful, all-wise God will sit on the throne and rule his people rightly. Everlasting Father, a figure of care for his people. Prince of Peace. Many princes over time in kingdoms around the world have pursued war and sought personal gain and we know those stories. But this royal son, he comes to bring peace. Peace with God and peace among the peoples of the world. At Christmas, we give thanks that this king is born, that this king is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high and that this king is coming again to claim his kingdom. And the offer of Christmas, the invitation of Christmas is to live under the gracious rule of this good king and to step into his marvelous light. Many here will know the King of Christmas and will be living under his rule. And for those of us who have bowed the knee to King Jesus, Christmas is a thrilling reminder, a thrilling reminder that his light has shattered the darkness of this world. And it prompts us to remember and to look forward to an eternity spent under his rule. But for some, I guess, perhaps even many here tonight, the words of Isaiah are intriguing, but you have yet to know this king. If, if that's you, we hope that you'll be interested enough in what you hear of this king to make a point of finding out more. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Long-Awaited Child. And maybe as you've been listening today, you realize that you don't know Jesus as king. But like Jonathan just said, you're interested in finding out more about this Jesus. I'd encourage you to contact us here at Encounter the Truth. You can do that by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. Click on that contact link. Let us know you'd like to know about how you can make Jesus the king of your life and begin a relationship with him. Again, our website address, EncounterTheTruth.org, or give us a call. Talk to one of our staff members. The toll-free number is 833-998-7884. That's 833-99-TRUTH. Let's get back to Jonathan's teaching from the book of Isaiah. We begin a message called The Gentle Shepherd. On Saturday last week, a five-year-old boy in Jackson, Mississippi, made a 911 call to the police to report that the Grinch was trying to steal Christmas. The boy informed his mother that he had made this important call, but she really didn't take him very seriously at all until the officer showed up on the step responding to this very alarming report. Well, I'm glad to be able to reassure you this morning that all is well. The Grinch has not stolen Christmas this year. But while the Grinch would be quite unable to steal Christmas this year or any other year, plenty of folk around the world will feel that Christmas has been stolen from them by other people and other events. We celebrate Christmas this year as every year, really, mindful that we live in a world where many will find it difficult to join in the festivities, will find it hard to celebrate, because they are right now living through very difficult circumstances. They are living perhaps under the cloud of war, They're walking through the veil of grief. They're enduring the plight of illness. They're coming to terms with one form of tragedy or another. They're struggling with loneliness or family conflict or financial need 
They're dealing with the realities of life in a broken world, life in a world where things are not as they should be, not as they might be. We all know those realities, they're familiar enough to us, and the Bible doesn't shy away from any of them. Right from its opening pages, right from the earliest pages of the book of Genesis, at the beginning of the Bible, it addresses the problems of our world head on. It tells us the story of God's creation of a perfect and a pain-free world. But it tells us that almost right away, humanity rejected God and his good way of life. And interestingly, rather than just stop us in our tracks and force us to obey, force us to conform, God has actually turned us over to our chosen path. And he has allowed us to wander down it. He's allowed us to taste that very bitter fruit of our choices. The passage we're looking at today in Isaiah chapter 40 is addressed to God's people Israel at a time when they were experiencing those realities in a particularly sharp and a particularly painful way. Isaiah chapter 40 speaks to the people of Israel during a very dark time, a dark chapter in their history, when the great city of Jerusalem and its temple lay in ruins and many of their number were living in exile in the land of Babylon. The story of those events is actually the story of a great tragedy, but none of it came as a surprise. Years before the exile, the people of Israel had been turning away from the Lord in disobedience and they'd stopped listening to his word and heeding his word. And in response to their behavior over a long period of time, he had promised to punish them by sending them away from their land and into exile in Babylon. Isaiah had predicted that catastrophe back in chapter 39, but now in chapter 40, in our passage, he looks forward prophetically to the end of that time and announces a very different message, a message of great comfort. To a people living in a land, living in a world under judgment, a people experiencing and tasting the fruit of their rebellion against God and their rejection of him, well, to such a people... Isaiah now has the very joyful task of announcing not more judgment and pain, but comfort. Comfort from the Lord himself. Verse 1, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. God's people are to take comfort, and the reason is simply this. The Lord himself has come to them. Verse 3, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. The Lord is coming and he's coming to lead his people home from Babylon and back to their great city of Jerusalem. The long wait is over. Salvation is at hand. In his great kindness, God comforted his ancient people, Israel, when he let them return home to Jerusalem all those years ago. But the promise of these verses, the promise of the comfort of salvation, of the forgiveness of sin, and of the Lord's presence with his people, it points beyond that return from exile. The New Testament writers show us in a whole lot of different ways that these historical events in the return from exile, they were only a taster for a greater salvation yet to come. The great reality of these verses would be found in the coming of Christ, first at Christmas, to bring salvation to a needy world. And so Isaiah chapter 40 is in a very wonderful way a Christmas promise. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called The Gentle Shepherd. Now, we're going to continue this message in our next broadcast. I do hope you make it a point to tune in as we've really just gotten started today. We're going to continue to look at Isaiah 40 next time. If you ever miss a broadcast, always come and listen online. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. While you're at the website, I just want to take a quick second and invite you to uh, make it a point to give a year-end gift and help us finish this year strong. It is your generosity that keeps Encounter the Truth on this station. If you'd like to give a year-end gift, just come to the website, EncounterTheTruth.org, or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Thanks for doing that, and I hope you'll join us next time.